and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this of, of this most holy of temples, jeez, I fucked it up already, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A man currently developing Fight to Survive, as well as the spearhead of Radio Games James. I love alliteration. Who is, de who is dedicated to forcing into existence a wide variety of niche tabletop RPGs. The one and only James Kerr. But he is not a Kerr. How are you doing today, man? Oh, holy Mildra, thank you for inviting me into your temple. I bring these nice alms. <laughs> Oh, so uh, I'll start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Oh, by all means. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, I guess I was in high school, and I was at a, a, a scuzzy basement apartment of an older friend, like a, somebody who was like 22 or something, who probably shouldn't have been hanging out with high school kids. And it was a horrible basement apartment under a bar... And the apartment stank of cigarettes and the walls were yellow. And it was the day after a party and they, one of them said, hey, do you guys want to play some Dungeons and Dragons? And I thought, oh, I don't know what that is. And I thought it was kind of a board game. And we played it. And I thought, holy crap, it's like a video game, except you can do whatever you want. I love this. And then I badgered my friends to continue us playing Dungeons and Dragons for quite a while. And then uh, that got me started on my, on my quest. And in role playing. If I had if I had to take a stab in the dark as far as which version of D and D it was, um, I'm guessing Beck me. Oh, um, I mean, if I was pushed into a corner, I would definitely say that Beck me is my favorite version of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, the person who is running it was using both some second edition rule books and the rule cyclopedia. Uh, in tandem, which, you know, only kind of, can only kind of go together. <laughs> but, uh, so whatever edition it was that was uh, exclusive to him, that's what we were playing. Some kind of, like, second ed Celtic Cyclopedia hybrid. I've seen, I've seen Stranger Kit bashes over the years. Oh. And since Dungeons the Dragoning exists, I can't say that any kit bash is too weird. Yeah, between white hacks and black hacks and red hacks and blue hacks, you know, you, you can hack as many colors as the rainbow for uh, well, different Dungeons and Dragons. To put things into perspective, Dungeons the Dragoning was a project that someone did on a dare that was trying to mix elements of D&D, &D, Warhammer 40k, 7th C, Planescape, Exalted, World of Dark and World of Darkness into one th rule set. Uh-huh. And somehow it actually works. No, I'm sure it works about as well as that description. <laughs> no, it, it works to the point where it's actually viable. Oh, okay. And he released the thing on April 1st, and everybody thought it was a joke until they opened the thing up and realized, wait, someone could actually run a proper campaign with this. <laughs> oh, good for him. Oh. Just remember, genius and insanity are two sides of the same coin. Yep. I mean, yes. <laughs> but the vibe that I got when I was going through the Kickstarter for Fight, for Fight to Survive was that you're very much a guy who, sit, who jumped around between systems over the years. Would that be accurate? Um, I don't know. It depends what you call jumping around. Like, I, I have... You know, I did play Dungeons and Dragons for quite a while. I I played several years of it in the same campaign, f bringing a character from level one up to level fourteen. But generally speaking, like I had, a, I was blessed. One of those people blessed with a weekly group that never failed, really. So uh, I got a chance to play a lot and to do a lot. And the group that I was in was already playing a diverse. Uh, number of systems and just they just liked couching with D&D &D. and then eventually I became the forever GM uh, just always running and my interests in running were were very diverse so I was always running a new game or a new system 
a new structure every couple of weeks. And that uh, led me into being kind of a system junkie uh, to trying to hunt down and, and go over the most obscure or interesting systems that I could find to really understand the underpinnings of a lot of these mechanics. So yeah, I've, I guess I've bounced around to an awful lot of systems. Um, I, I've known other system junkies who have uh, far more uh, ludicrous cravings than I do about getting every every little system, but um, I think I'm pretty up there in terms of my cravings. Do you go to System Junkies Anonymous meetings every Sunday? Well, if I did, I wouldn't <laughs> tell you because cause it's anonymous. No, <laughs> <laughs> now, with Fight to Survive... First off, I I appreciate the um, the in, the influence chart that you put in. That was one that was one giant um, graffiti collection. I've been seeing I've been seeing these sort of influence charts a bit more on Kickstarter projects, like how Mothership had it as a bingo sheet. Well, I'll be I'll be honest, Mildred. I that influence sheet directly came out of the Mothership bingo sheet because I loved that. I, I looked at that and I thought, wow. That's a fantastic way of displaying influences. And, <laughs> you know? I know plenty of artists who have who have done influence maps, and even I did one as a for a game design a long time ago, which is her, right now it's horrifically outdated. But it, but it's a thing I've seen I've seen artists and others do as far as well what their influences are. And hell, if you're gonna steal, may as well steal from the best. Well, I mean, we are all a confluence of influences, right? Everything that we do is informed by a sea of past decisions washing out on the wave of the future. So why not wear those on your sleeve and say, these are the things that I was thinking of. These are the things that I love. These are the things that I'm influenced by. Uh, just to give people a sense. Because, you know, the first question people ask when you bring to them a new system is they say, what's it like? As in, what are the comparisons that you can make? Yeah. And that's why my... My uh, elevator pitch has been for a while has been oh it's like Mouse Guard meets Bloodsport, <laughs> just just to get things down to it's a gross oversimplification but like just to get things down to something that's uh, easy to swallow it's nice and digestible. I um I did when it came to some of the video game inf influences that I saw on that thing I did have to give a bit of a glare because of um in it, it involves some games that tr that traumatized me growing up. <laughs> Oh yeah, like what? Like Art of Fighting or uh, yes, Final Art of Fight? Fighting, or... All three, yeah. all three of them, especially Art of Fighting Two. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're for aficionados. Art of Fighting, like it's a it's it's not easy. Uh, certainly, I love those games. I I am a fighting game fan. I um, you know was a was a Street Fighter champ, Street Fighter Two champ in the early nineties, uh, like an arcade champ, and uh, I did pretty well in the All Ontario, and uh, I love that stuff. But the and the influence is keenly felt on this game fight to survive. But uh, I wanted this game to be dialed back from the kind of fantastical nature of something like Street Fighter 2 and even Art of Fighting where people, you know, hurl fireballs across the room. So there's no fireballs in Fight to Survive. It's a, it's a lot more down to earth, low stakes, uh, well, high personal stakes, low, uh, you know, fireball, psycho power, um, you know, fight energy being commodified to build giant androids kind of structure yeah but yeah. the and of course of course um seeing fatal fury on the list i just get reminded of geese and i end up getting angry again yeah geese was a geese was a tough guy i mean he wasn't he, he i i would argue that geese was not as difficult in his games as rugal was in his but uh he's still a pain in the neck mm -hmm. uh at times yeah. well I mean, obviously now everybody knows about SNK boss syndrome, but nope. But we didn't fully know. We didn't fully know about that at the time. We just knew. Well, I want to. I, I yeah, no, it's it's true. And you know, if we're going to talk about video games, I really want to focus on the fact that I loved that first Final Fight game, and not necessarily because of what it was. If if you backed me into a corner, I'd rather play. Um, uh, uh, sorry, I meant Fatal Fury, the first Fatal Fury. I would rather play Fatal Fury Special or uh, one of the you know one of the real bouts or something or, or Garu. But um, the first Fatal Fury was such an interesting game because the whole thing takes place in Southtown, hmm. and you get a choice of what territories you go to and who you're going to defeat for the territories. You get a sense of the like. There's these little kingpins in the martial world, and maybe that doesn't have kind of a monetary. Uh, allocation but maybe it's just by reputation but you you go around the city kind of like uh, beating people up to be the the you know the king dude 
And there was such an interesting structure of environments changing and of things changing within a fight. Like Tung Fu Ru would go from being a little old man to being this hulking behemoth hurling fireballs. And I remember very well the panic I felt in the arcade at the time being like, oh, oh God, oh God, get away from him. Where's the other plane? <laughs> and uh, um, that, that kind of like sense of territory and that kind of sense of street level you know, you know, hulking old men aside, uh, is part of what I really wanted to bring into fights to survive. The the sensation that you're just you're just a couple of dudes whose girlfriend has been kidnapped, and you need to hit Southtown and try and get her back. And you know, there's this big corporate guy named Geese, and you're gonna take him down. Like that's that's a good that's a fun trope to exist within, yeah. uh, and you can do a lot with that. So I wanted to try and bring out those elements. Uh, from the game. That's why I found it very inspirational, the first the first Fatal Fury. Mm -hmm. um, w within, the, within that, there is, given what you mentioned about that kind of thing, there is one um, film from the, from the late 70s that I was, cu I was curious if you, would, if you would count as an influence, if you were able to squeeze it in there some, somehow, because there's not a whole lot of room on the thing as it is. And that is The Warriors. Oh yeah, definitely. So the Warriors was directed by Walter Hill, mm -hmm. uh, and it's his first film is on that list, which is Hard Times, the 1975 film about Charles Bronson's character uh, as a 1930s drifter who was a street fighter who walked around uh, beating people up in New Orleans during the Depression. The backgrounds, like there's, sorry, I'm going to geek out about like the crossover between video games and movies here, but the backgrounds that were used in Hard Times were actually used in Street Fighter 2 when it came time to do Street Fighter 2, right? So that was Walter Hill's first film. And then his, uh, I, I don't, he made a few films between those, but like The Warriors was one of his big films and, uh, which is great. Uh, but it's kind of a post-apocalyptic or like an alternate kind of structure. I couldn't really use it in a history. Uh, but Streets of Fire was his like most notorious flop, which is also on that chart as a huge influence. Hmm. Streets of Fire, which also was ripped off by Capcom to make Final Fight. So there's this weird relationship between uh, uh, Walter Hill and Capcom specifically, but a lot of people don't know this, but Renegade was this video game from Taito in 1984, I think, 1984. It was, it was an arcade game. It was amazing. It never got a proper home port. Uh, and in Japan, it was part of the Corona kun series, which is like a, a series of delinquent high school kids in their high school uniforms that go around beating people up. They thought they wouldn't understand that in the westernization, so they dressed them all up in The Warriors like from Walter Hill's The Warriors, those outfits. Anyway, the style caught on so much over here, even though it was just some kind of crappy localization, that that's what made Double Dragon. Because the guy who did uh, Renegade went on, his sequel was Double Dragon. They liked the art style of what was localized here so much that they continued the genre. And then Double Dragon fed back into Final Fight. So there's this guy out there, his film director, Walter Hill, who probably has no idea that he's had a profound influence on... Japanese video games, the beat 'em up genre, the fighting game genre, and how we perceive uh, a kind of tough, tough guy martial arts world that never existed. Yeah, and um, that's that's my rant. I'm yeah, sorry. So of, <laughs> well, when it when it comes to influences, I uh, it's amusing to it's amusing to me that blood that um you listed Bloodsport because of the influences that that has had. She, um one of the big one of the big instances is well i think i think either to i think either ed or tobias outright admitted that bloodsport was one of the big inspirations for mortal Kombat. and there's the, there's i'm not sure if this was ever confirmed but there's this long standing story that johnny cage was supposed to be played by jean claude van damme but for one other reason one reason or another the deal fell through yeah, I've heard those rumors as well, and like Mortal Kombat is filled with little tiny nods to other martial arts. Like Liu Kang is clearly supposed to be just a Bruce Lee surrogate, and Sonya Blade is clearly supposed to be Cynthia Rothrock. Mm -hmm. um, and you can you can break down like, and then the ninjas, of course, are just straight out of 1981's Enter the Ninja. They might as well just be called Frank Nero. Uh, so it's uh, I, I mean, I love Mortal Kombat for its style. It's um. It's gameplay didn't age as well, certainly, but it's uh, it's got a lot of style to it, and I really appreciate that. Yeah. Now, with all, with all of that, the other thing that I wanted to 
dip into is the tabletop influences because there's some there's some interesting names that you br that you bring up. Obviously, one of the bigger ones is Powered by the Apocalypse, which needs no introduction. Uh, but one that I wanted I wanted to highlight is the work of Greg Stafford, especially um, King Arthur Pendragon, because I don't think a lot of people fully realize how massively influential Greg Stafford's work has been to tabletop gaming. I hope they do. I hope that they know because his he's he was freaking brilliant. Like um, I I think King Arthur Pendragon, uh, the fifth edition specifically, is probably my favorite role playing game. If uh, if I'm going to be pressed, I loved the way it took concepts like let's actually do something medieval. Like people talk about Dungeons and Dragons being medieval, but it, it's not really medieval. It's more I like called, Renaissance without gunpowder. I call stuff like D and D and the like the Tolkien melting pot. Yeah, I mean, I think it has more to do with, like, American Midwestern frontiersman attitudes than it does anything to do with Tolkien, really. But uh, but it's very far away from medieval life, right? In medieval life, you lived, you were born, and you died within five miles of your home. You didn't go outside during the winter if you could help it. Like, uh, you often died of strange diseases and didn't know why. Or, you know, I guess you only die once, but people often died of strange diseases. So I loved how uh, Greg Stafford could take those very gritty elements, like rolling on the winter table and like only adventuring in the summer and a sense of progression of age, and uh, marry them to Le Morte to Arthur and other kind of fantastical notions, so that you had just a bit of fantasy kind of twisting the, uh, the very gritty reality of what's going on. So in the same game, you had the, the incident of... Uh, you know, oops, you, your, your, your child got sick in their fourth year and, and they're going to die from the sickness uh, just, just, just because, just because life is hard uh, along with, oh, and here's the, the stats for Titania, the fairy queen. <laughs> like, yeah, you, I get the feeling you, you, um, you'd end up get you'd end up getting a kick out of the Crusader Kings video game series. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I haven't played it. Uh, I I could I could be playing it. I I used to play a lot of video games. I don't play as many video games anymore because I'm a parent and my time is limited. So I kind of have to narrow down on my interests. And ultimately, if if we're talking about video games and tabletop role playing games, uh, RPGs win in in my in my heart. Oh, uh, but <laughs> that's how I spend my time. For me, when it comes to Stafford and his influences. Um... The big, the big one is just is just everything that spun off from RuneQuest, and as well mm. as the fact that RuneQuest's setting, Glorantha, is st even to this day is still fairly unique. Um, well, yeah, and Greg Stafford, like people talk about King Arthur Pendragon as being his opus, and I love it. But he felt that Glorantha was his opus, right? He's he's spoken quite openly about it being his uh, his favorite work. I mean, it's it's not one work; it's like you know, gobs and gobs of work. But it's it's uh, it's his. It was his favorite, apparently, and I yeah. I can see why. And I I of course I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the fact that the system the system that it pioneered is is what would eventually morph into. Um, basic role playing, which is utilized by Call of Cthulhu, Stormbringer, and a bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of King Arthur Pendragon's influence uh, on fight to survive, mm -hmm. I wanted to very, it very blatantly intimidate its uh, generational aspects. But I thought it would be really interesting to apply it to a martial arts setting, where you would have, uh, you could be a, a martial artist, but as uh, every game session is one to three years or so so time advances you age your body becomes more frail you your ability increases you get better at things but you just can't take the hits anymore and through that and through circumstance and through just having history uh, eventually your character is going to want to step aside or is going to die or whatever else and the martial lineage passes to a successor and then to a successor so you end up playing the whole in fight to survive of the 20th century more or less, like as a chunk of history. And that I developed it that way very intentionally because of King Arthur Pendragon, because we were I was going through the great Pendragon campaign, 
And I was thinking, gee, I, I'm getting to know these years really well. Like we're really learning like a little bit of history here in a very interesting way that makes us feel uh, like we're really part of, a, of like a living world. And I'd love to be able to replicate that for people for the 20th century in a kind of, uh, you know, pseudo historical notion of martial arts. Yeah. So that's where that influence fed in. And um, I will ad I will admit that at, at one point I did I did do in I did um I did run a I did run a campaign I think I I think at the time I was using a heavily modified version of Weapons of the Gods for this to el to illustrate a ta illustrate a town that you that had a bunch of diff a bunch of different fighting schools and and the like. This kind because I wanted to do this juxtaposition between the martial arts schools that you see in a that you see in a um, wuxia project with um er, with a more urban fiction. Mm. Um, well, there are quite a few very strong wuxia um, role playing games out there. Oh, uh, yeah. That is that is a genre that has been I think well well cared for in tabletop role playing games. Mm -hmm. But when I looked around, I found nothing for the martial artist. I mean, there's lots of games with martial arts, but there, uh, I don't know if you know, Eric Wujic's work, ninjas and super spies, I do. but it's, it's an incredibly complicated, uh, and in-depth look at, at breaking down different martial arts, but you'd kind of have to know martial arts in order to get through it. Like beyond the fact that the system is particularly complicated, I think it's champions. It's, uh, it's not, ch it's not champions. It's, Oh, Palladium. is it heroes? It was, okay. It was well, Palladium and, all right. um, Palladium has been my whipping boy for over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll add that to the pile. Anyway, the point is, rather, even though the, even if you could get over the system, in order to understand the tactical relevance of the different martial arts, you kind of need to know a little bit about martial arts, about what's going on. And then the other side of things is martial arts and things like Dungeons and Dragons, where it's so heavily abstracted that it it's just becomes a little list of superpowers. And I really didn't want to do that. Uh, there, there's a bunch of role-playing games that are more or less anime style fighting games uh where you just get together and beat each other up and i, I don't want to begrudge anybody their fun like people can have fun that way but i wanted it to develop a game where the reason why you're fighting the context of you fighting the the motivation that's bringing you into a fight is just as important or more important than the fighting itself mm -hmm. and a game where it actually felt like you were getting into a fight uh not to emulate the real because we cannot emulate the real but we can chase verisimilitude and so uh making it so that you're making hard choices in a fight the way it would kind of feel like in a fight so to make it uh both gritty for a martial artist and so that it's understandable to somebody who doesn't know martial arts and there was no system that did that or uh well until i mean it doesn't now i hope yeah. i hope it doesn't now i hope I, you feel um, it doesn't. one of my mantras is one of my mantras when it comes to when it comes to just fiction as a whole has always been believability over realism because yeah people people don't tend to believe things that are real <laughs> it's true <laughs> well it's it's more of it's more about the fact that realism has certain connotations that i th that i think i think i think can bottleneck whereas if you present something in a way that that an audience can buy into it because an audience wants to be tricked <clears throat> then then, then they're more willing to buy a, a a setting's internal logic. Like anybody who know anybody who's worked with firearms knows that a actual silence, an actual suppressor, is not going to work the same way as a suppressor does in a film. There, you, it's not this little zipping, th this little zipping noise that a lot of films present it as. Mm. But because because of that whole internal logic thing. You don't. The only people you see making a stink about it are the um, grogs, and well, nobody likes those. <laughs> well, you need to be able to both celebrate. You need to be able to celebrate the content, uh, you know, that you're participating in. And I really wanted to make something that would celebrate the genre uh, of like like a cinematic sense of the genre of the films, but also like the the genre is kind of built as a cultural gestalt between various mediums and cinema is one of them video games is definitely one of them uh i could point to the uh, hong kong menhua of uh, oriental heroes as being one of them like there's different media influences that feed into this uh that i'm hoping fight to survive role-playing martial arts meets heart stands as the tabletop role-playing uh closed circuit on a lot of those influences as they come together yeah. oh 
I don't. I'm almost. Be, I'd almost be tempted to bring up the ridic the um ridi the ridiculous guest alt that that happened with um Lucha Underground, but that's a whole other can of worms. Um, we only have so many can of worms here on this. Uh, only yeah, time for so if, many can of worms. <laughs> yeah, and if uh, if I if I have too many of them, then the DNR is going to get mad at me for fishing out of season. <laughs> as if it, as if anybody uses anybody uses worms and uh, during fishing season. No, everybody uses either night crawlers or leeches. I just use night. Oh no, are, are worms? I'm not up on my fishing. Are worms the like yesterday's news for fishing? Most people, you, most people that I know use night crawlers, which are just bigger than than normal worms, and leeches are leeches. I don't like yeah. using leeches because they're really hard to grab. Okay. Um, but when it comes to the mechanics, I don't the know mechanics what, of fishing or uh... no, the, no, the <laughs> no, the mechanics of fight to survive, obviously. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I've often talked. I've often talked about how a lot, how a lot of mechanics design has a has for decades had a all roads lead to Rome kind of mentality regarding um, how resolution works. Like you do, and unlike in the early days, like with very early D and D, you don't have a collection of subsystems, each of them being resolved differently. You have one mechan You have one mechanic where everything turns. Uh, with that in mind, what would be the what would be the primary um resolution resolution mechanic i know you said you're going crunch medium but are you, but when it comes to the actual rolling of the dice it or lack thereof how do you handle it well it gets handed uh, handled mildred in a few different ways uh and there's a purpose behind that rather than having a unified mechanic uh, the fights are resolved dicelessly using a comparison of moves so, Mildred, if we were to get into a fight, uh, you might choose a few different moves, and I might choose a few different moves, and then we set them against each other. Every character has the same moves. They're uh, all defined by grapple, punch, kick, block, and footwork, and they form a kind of rock-paper-scissors relationship. It's a little bit more complex than that, especially when it comes to uh, blocking and uh, footwork, which don't do damage, they just mitigate it. But... Uh, it, every character has those five moves because it's based on the Bruce Lee quote, and I'm going to paraphrase horribly, that he uh, said in the Pierre Burton show in, I think, 1971. He said, uh, unless human being have six arms and six legs, you're going to fight like a human being. So everybody has the same five moves. Keep it easy. Keep it straight. And when we get into a fight, you get to choose usually three uh, of those moves, and you can make a repetition, and then we do a call and response. So you might say, I, I punch the guy, and then I might respond with, well, I'm going to kick. And a kick beats punch, so I win that exchange, uh, and you'll have to come up with another move. We go back and forth until there's no more moves, and somebody gets hit. I'm so there's a lot of tactics involved in that, because you know that if a kickboxer is coming out, that he's going to kick, and you know that you want to prep a bunch of grapples, because you know that that's going to overcome a kick. Uh, but the moves are simple enough that it creates a kind of mind game of trying to guess somebody's tactics, which does feel... Uh, it feels a lot more accurately, <laughs> like you're you're trying to uh, out get you're trying to guess somebody, trying to read somebody, like you would in a fight. Oh, in a weird way, it kind of reminds me of the card game Yomi. If you're familiar with that, I'm not. No, sorry. Uh, Yomi was one of the card games that was the brainchild of um, Serlin, who's who's responsible for for the Fantasy Strike setting that's had several that's had that's used several um several board games and one video game for it he was also the guy who wrote the book um play to win and what well, had helped out with the hd remix of street fighter 2 turbo oh yeah i i've i've played fantasy strike the video game i haven't uh and i i'm sure i own the hd remix of street fighter 2 turbo mm -hmm. oh he and uh, fan fantasy strike is an fantasy strike is an interesting thing where it's a very good teaching tool I think, but there is the, but with y Yomi was kind of where a lot of it started, and that game had a had characters as decks with a very rock paper scissors approach to a lot to a lot of the basic moves. Hmm. 
Well, this is a this is five moves, um, so you certainly couldn't make a, a deck out of it circumstantially. Uh, but you can also use these things cross contextually. So, for instance, if you're Bruce Lee and you're walking in in Fist of Fury into a, a whole Japanese dojo, uh, and you want to have one person versus an outnumbered group, uh, they also have the same five moves. They just represent different things when you're talking about a larger outnumbered group, or if you're talking about weapons, or if you're talking about guns, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so it's easy to be cross contextual. So if, uh, you know, the large group wants to rush in and pummel you, uh, which is like imitating a punch, you know that your kick is going to beat that punch so you can kick them all, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So it's easy to resolve large scale uh, combat because, you know, I wanted a game that was easy to run, but would feel, uh, have a lot of depth to it because you got to, it's got to be intuitive. The mechanics have to be intuitive. Otherwise they're going to be uh, forgotten, quickly forgotten. So, uh, you can't build a deck out of this because there's only five moves, but uh, you can stack them how you like. But a lot of it has to do with uh, strategy, the strategy that you adopt. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure somebody would easily figure out how to do um, some cheat sheet cards because, let, because let's be honest, we were we were all utilizing index cards in one form or another as either players or DMs. I know I still have some of my index card boxes somewhere in the back. <laughs> I mean, index cards are handy. Uh, you know, most of the play groups for Fight to Survive um, just use a sheet of paper or something to write down the moves that they're going to use that round and cross them off. Uh, so I've seen some people use t Scrabble tiles uh, to represent the different moves. I've seen some people use uh, index cards, certainly, but most people, when they get going after a few games, they just do it in their head. Yeah. Um, but when it's funny that we brought up fighting games earlier because you look at the ro you look at the roster of a lot of fighting games, even in the earliest days, mm -hmm. and the thing that I'll always find interesting is rep is representing a wide variety of of um fighting styles, even with just the three characters that you always focused on in the in um say the original Fatal Fury, or just or just the two characters that you focused on with Art of Fighting. There's still there's it's not a case where ever, where where um, people are going to be playing exactly the same. And given how the choice of the choice of one's fighting style is going is going to be is going to be important in in say a fighting game or or even in certain films. How is that represented within the mechanics of fight to survive? If somebody is using Wing Chun or somebody's using Kung Fu or if they're using um, bare, they're using bare knuckle boxing, or so on. Well, it's represented very. It, it has a profound effect on the character. Uh, the there are five basic martial arts presented in Fight to Survive, which uh, r correspond to the basic moves pretty much. So it's kung fu, karate, boxing, wrestling, and kickboxing. That being said, that's me trying to make things relatable to somebody who's coming at it for uh, not knowing martial arts, so that it's still approachable. You just pick among these five. They all have different kind of principles. There are more than 50, game, uh, 50 martial arts represented in Fight to Survive. Because just as uh, you think about how you, a martial art does not teach you anything, it gives you things that you can, that you can learn. Uh, you have to walk through the door. So how martial arts mechanics are reinforced in the game is they give you different bonuses to what you're training in when you go to learn. Uh, because I have a martial arts background, Mildred, so I wanted to be able to represent how that structure comes into play in a person's life. So you might have a karate teacher, and the karate teacher wants you to improve your, your stance work, wants you to, to strengthen your high block. Uh, so they'll give you a bonus if you train in block during the training segments that are available in the game. Uh, this is very different than if you've got somebody who's a Muay Thai practitioner, for instance. Uh, you know, the, the Muay Thai teacher might want you to focus on your your shin kicks, you know, or might want you to focus on hopping over a banana tree as it grows, or might want you to focus on, uh, you know, running up a mountain. So you, you're, the training that you get directs the character to be stronger in this way or that way, which has a profound twisting of the character. I also wanted to be able to represent the fact that martial arts are not, are not like a class. Like you don't choose this thing and then you just are that thing. You're not like karate guy and then you know you level up into different karate skills or anything. You like you you choose these things as your lifestyle. Uh, but if you have the opportunity to, to learn under a different teacher, they just give you different bonuses because you you know some people drift 
in terms of their martial practices in their lives. Most people who are serious martial artists end up picking up two or three martial arts over the course of their lives. Maybe not as with as much focus, certainly as their primary one, but, uh, but it does end up happening. So I wanted to be able to accommodate that structure. Mm -hmm. In that regard, um, it's funny you mentioned classes because the way you describe it, I'm, I am reminded of a class system from from a certain game, but it's not, but it isn't one of the more expected ones. I was reminded of the class system that's utilized in Role Master and its successors, like Against the Dark Master and Anima. Mm. In the sense that while they are classes, it's more akin to archi it's more akin to archetypes, because when you let when you level up in one of those and Merp is another example of this thing. You get you get a set of points in cer in certain fields, but depending on your class, you'd end up get you'd end up getting a a wider breadth to de to develop in cer in certain areas than others. But it's still all point based. Yeah, I mean, in this game, there's no classes and there's no levels. You don't level up; you just get older. Uh, and the by virtue of the experience of going out and playing, you may gain more uh, more of an ability to train, or you may uh, be able to grow stronger in different ways, uh, just by just by coming out and doing and being and acting, and based on the choices that you make. Mm -hmm. um, so characters grow a lot, and like as I said earlier, as they age, they um, they start to deteriorate physically. Like you might have an injury that has lingered there for years and you've just never been able to get rid of it because, you know, you got into a, uh, a back alley brawl in 52 and somebody tried to mug you coming out of a nightclub and uh, they stabbed you in the shoulder and that shoulder never really healed, healed properly. Like mechanically, it just means that there's a health checkbox on your, uh, on your sheet that you were never able to erase. Mm -hmm. And so you may get to the point where your character is uh, too old or frail or overcome with injury to really continue in a violent lifestyle. Uh, so we, you talked about mechanics, like what's the driving mechanic here? I, t I told you what the fight mechanic was, but they didn't tell you about the other half of the game, which is heart. So role-playing martial arts meets heart. Mm -hmm. Every character has a, um, a harm track, like a health track, that when it exceeds, you die. But they also have a harmship track. Everything that uh, happens in your life that's lousy, you get one hardship. Your dog ran away, you get a hardship. You lost your job, you get a hardship. And just like health, if that hardship track is exceeded, you quit this violent lifestyle and you leave. You leave the game. Your character's gone and it's out of there. How do you prevent yourself from leaving the game? Well, you have a system of comforts, people, places, and things that you care about that you uh, use to reduce your hardship. So you might have a person like my girlfriend Cindy, plus three. Uh, you might have a place like... Um, your fancy dojo plus one, and you might have a thing like your red headband. I don't know. Uh, so when you've got a hardship that's up too high, you can go and you can visit Cindy, spend a night with Cindy, and uh, you know, out on the town having drinks or something, and then it goes down by three, and your hardship is under more manageable levels. So the whole system is this tension between violence and having to deal with the lifestyle of violence. So fights, getting into fights... Uh, are dangerous physically, but you also are taking on hardship, and then you've got to try and deal with that hardship with your life. But here's the real kicker, Mildred: the comforts, you know, your Cindy and your uh, your dojo and your headband, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are exactly what goes on the chopping block every game. So the GM will identify a comfort and say this comfort is under threat. So maybe Cindy has been kidnapped by the River Street Gang, who's uh, holding her hostage, and you need to go get her back. That's going to cause you hardship just for it ha having happened. And if you don't get Cindy back, it's going to cause you a whole bunch of hardship, and it's going to be very distressing. Mm -hmm. And then you won't have her as a comfort anymore. Or maybe your uh, dojo was under attack because somebody just walked in and smashed your school sign and said, Your Kung Fu sucks! Mm -hmm. And well, you took on the hardship for that, and now you've got to defend your dojo, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's this huge tension between... Uh, the fights that you get into, how dangerous fights are to get into, and trying to get your life in order in the game, basically. And that informs the rest of the kind of large-scale macrocosmic uh, mechanical consideration for the game. Yeah. Now, with that in, with that in mind, when it given what given what we met given what we what you mentioned earlier regarding the diff, regarding the different styles obviously it's impossible to to, to try and em, to try and emulate every style with a get with a in in one book 
So have you given have you given thought to putting ad, advice on how, on how some, on how someone could hack a uh, hack a hack into the rule set of martial art that isn't covered in the core book? Well, okay, yes, absolutely because I think once you get a look at how because there's there's about there's just over 50 of them in the book and that's pretty comprehensive, but there are there are other things if you really want to, you can you can break down uh, the influence of Spanish Arnis as opposed to indigenous Filipino Escrima. Like you you can go that fine uh, if you really want to and and pioneer your own kind of structure within what it is. The, all the tools are given to you to be able to do that. I also have a number of expansion books uh, with that are on the stretch goals for the Kickstarter, where I can really deep dive and focus more on on some of the structures uh, and allow a lot more martial arts. Like I think 50 is getting is starting to get uh, a little maybe a little pedantic for people who don't particularly care about the difference between northern praying mantis style kung fu and southern praying mantis style kung fu and don't really want me to listen to me talking about how they have a completely different lineage and nothing to do with each other. Um, so I've got a, a kung fu book plan, for instance, where I get to really dive in into the styles of kung fu and talk about Shaw Brothers kung fu films and the Golden Harvest kung fu films because that's a whole book into itself. Mm -hmm. But the fight to survive main book is supposed to give be it like a like in some ways it's it's just a springboard to action. It's giving you everything you need to fill in uh, the details on this colorful world and to get you started playing and to make your own stories based on what's going on. Uh, there are like there's a lot of martial arts in there, uh, but you are free to make your own. Or if you disagree with me about how I structured Goju Ryu Karate uh, versus, you know, uh, a kind of Chinese Kempo uh, versus American Kempo or, or how you want to structure those debates that, you know, definitely you're able to go in and dig in and do that and make those changes. Yeah. Without upsetting anything, <laughs> furthermore. Like without you know, without breaking the uh the cart uh, or the wheels on the cart. Yeah, and truth be told, when I was th when I was thinking of of ones that of ones to eat on how they'd either be co covered or ad addressed or whatnot, um a lot of the ones you mentioned weren't exact weren't the ones I was thinking of. One of the ones I was thinking of was actually um Savat. I mean Savat's in there. Um but it, it, like there is a difference i mean if you really want to split hairs there's a difference between like uh early century savat and how savat developed when influenced by some other kickboxing techniques in the later half of the 20th century um like i don't want to put i don't want to split hairs on this but like yeah savat is in there uh and uh but like you know for instance the difference between um Aik japanese aikido or you know uh Japanese jiu-jitsu and Brazilian jiu-jitsu, for instance, right? There's definitely some pronounced differences between those two styles. One of them is made for a larger frame. The other one's more compact. You could make arguments about one of them being more uh, combat applicable, depending on how you want to approach things. Uh, but, and one of them is literally a bigger style. But how much are they going to, how much difference is that really going to make within the mechanical manifestation of the game? Uh, you know, not a, not a whole ton of a lot, but I've, opened it up so that people can affect what is going on and influence those structures. So in a way that makes sense and in a way that gives you control over what's going on, uh, because once you understand the methodology, it's, it's easy, it's easy to do. It's easy to structure. You're not going to break anything. Like you're given this area to play in. Uh, it's not going to break the game. The game is very finely balanced and that's not, um, enough to break it. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Am I, I hope I, I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, within now within that, you had also met, you had also given the hint that within the core book will be kind kind of a built-in setting of Metro City, which is, le which is legally distinct from other Metro cities, the best kind of distinct. Well, I'd like to point out that uh, Final Fight, the video game, it does have the setting of Metro City, but so does Astro Boy. Astro Boy also takes place in Metro City. Uh, and dozens and dozens of other stories take place in the generically named Metro City, uh, none of them having anything to do with each other. So similarly, this has nothing to do with any property that's come before it, uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's a fun place. It's a closed 
city with a number of different culturally distinct districts uh, with economic and cultural boundaries. And uh, crossing them is, can come sometimes be a big deal. And your allegiance to them determines which side of the tracks is the wrong side of the tracks. And lots of adventure is there to be had within just the city alone. Really, it was a big excuse to make the game easier to run. Because as a GM, you can say, oh, yeah, they're over here in uh, in Southtown. <laughs> they're over here in uh, the Parkside. <laughs> yeah, it's over. So that it's contained within a, um, a definable area and everything that you need to happen can happen there. If you want to go traveling in the game, like go international, go visit Japan, whatever else you want to do, that happens all the time. But I just wanted to make it so that there was a uh, definable place so that it felt like home. Like it felt like there was a home for the characters. And to be fair, you need Hill Valley before you can even go to Japan, if you catch my drift. <laughs> it's true, it's true. And in and whenever the and of course the advantage of having of having that kind of stay put thing is that you can you can devote more time to developing the who's who within the within that area and ha and Make it make it so that no man is an is an island. Yeah. Well, mechanically, you're constantly going back to your comforts, right? Mm -hmm. So my girlfriend Cindy might be my comfort for a person. I would want to hang out with Cindy if I, in order to get the benefit of using her as a comfort. If I'm off in, you know, uh, the Philippines, I'm not going to be able to access Cindy unless she she came with me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, similarly, if I've got a sports car as my thing, I might calm down and relieve hardship by driving it around. If I don't have access to my sports car, I can't do that. So leaving metro city becomes a big deal mechanically but also those comforts can have different relationships so cindy might be my girlfriend but mildra she might be your sister uh you know you might uh have the you might be the landlord for my dojo uh you know we might both go have pie at the same restaurant uh, so these places you are part of your community and you have to be part of your community uh, in order for the mechanics to work out, like in order for your character to survive. Uh, so you're fighting for the things that are in your life. You're fighting for the things that you have personal stakes over. It's not just a case of like, let's put two people in a vacuum and just have them pummel each other. Um, we need we need context. We need reasoning. But it also gets to fit within really fun kind of, you know, a little bit campy genre conventions of like, um, you know, you're... Your kung fu teacher has been poisoned. You need to go find the antidote. It is found only by the rival kung fu school that are not going to give it up. And, you know, like you can feed into a lot of fun there, um, but uh, it still feels feels personal. Personal stakes. Yeah, and I will ad I will admit that at one point when I did when I did a um I did a kind of faction setup in one of my campaigns. Um, you know how we talk. You know how we've talked about if you're gonna steal, steal from the best. Um, Definitely. <laughs> in that particular case, a, a lot of the stealing that I did was just take was just taking no was just taking notes from a lot of the st a lot of the stables that were going on in New Japan Pro Wrestling because while well, I'm a big wrestling fan as well as well as somebody who likes um, martial arts and uh, and everything that entails. Oh, who cares? You you obfuscate <laughs> the material, and people appreciate it. Like people appreciate the structures. These are genre. These are genre structures, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm sure everybody had a great time. Oh, they did because they they were well aware of it too. And with it, with each of the stables ar around that time, um, there was a there was a kind of theme that you could that you could easily build a faction around. You have you have Bullet Club, who are very much the invaders, very much trying to bring in. Amer trying to bring in American style motifs into Puroresu. Um you have Los Ingrenables de Japón who it who is obviously bringing a lot of um lucha libre influences. You have um Suzuki Gun which is run by the murder grandpa Minoru Suzuki, the scary the scariest man in the world. <laughs> and you have just a, bu a bunch you have in that a bunch of people who are, who are just prize fighters in every, in every sense of the word, um, and you have chaos, the one good guy faction trying to hold trying to hold things together. It's funny that chaos should be the thing trying to hold everyone together. <laughs> well, originally the faction's name was was Rise, but that but um that's a whole uh, that's a whole other can of worms. But just with the, <laughs> just with those four, there's enough material that you can that you can build around to 
to do to mess to um to bi to build stories out of absolutely yeah and you have you have one you have one fa you have one gang who's tr who's trying to who's trying to be the peacekeepers one gang who's the pe the newcomers who just rolled into town and they're running around like they own the place um you've got you've got one you've got one that you, that you could that you could style as the equivalent of old money um not in not in terms of wealth but in terms of this gang's been around since the city what since the city started and they're not move they're not moving if it, they're not moving if they've got any say about it well if you're interested in doing those kind of faction complexities it's pretty easy to do in fight to survive because you guys can be coming from rival schools mm -hmm. uh like rival karate dojos or whatever mm -hmm. uh, or you could be coming from the same place but uh how you connect and cross and uh is just dictated by virtue of play and the decisions that you make so you can get some pretty complex relationships going right off the hop yeah i was kind of discouraged by how in every other martial arts role-playing game, it seems they're really only like as you get nicher and nicher with your tabletop role-playing game design. Like this is very niche. Typically, it's only good for one-offs, right? It's not good for a large-scale investment. But with Fight to Survive, the what you're doing gets richer the more games you play, because as these comforts continue to come under threat and be saved and and uh, and change over time, you have an outrageously rich history with these people and places and things that are getting mixed around between the characters, the reasons why you're fighting. So you could easily go into a, a, like, oh yeah, there's the Golden Goose Casino. You know, it doesn't look like much now, but in the 1920s, it was a roaring place where there was a, a fight pit in the basement where people used to gamble, but it all went up in the fire of 72, you know? And like, so you, you end up with a, like, but this is dictated during play. This isn't coming from a meta narrative uh, within, at, like from outside of the game. You end up, having a really deep connection with the material and in terms of a gm running it i get to find out what happens by yeah. virtual play which is my favorite part i just get to i get to enjoy like i just put a comfort under threat i'm like oh poison's bar is uh, under threat it's closing because it can't make back taxes so what do you guys want to do oh. and then that's the then the, the session just goes and violence ensues the um well one one other aspect I will admit I I like doing um fa I like doing faction work because a lot a lot of people would think that I do that I do that because of something like World of Darkness when actually one of my f one of my favorite role playing games is Legend of the Five Rings. Oh yeah, which certainly has its fair share of samurai drama and tragedy, but also a whole lot of political intrigue. With well, yeah. with how well, with how the clans have. Have varying degrees of respect or disrespect for each other, which is a which is a vast simplification of the matter. And in the if I were if I were to if I were to transfer that city campaign that I mentioned beforehand, the approach that I end up taking is um do, is doing a who done it with the with the mur with the murder of the guy who owns a owns a place simply called the shop, which the sh the which cuz i i like the idea of a hub that's th that's this neutral territory where anybody can come in but there's one but there's one simple rule absolutely no fighting well that's going to create a lot of tension like i like it as from a from a story perspective absolutely but uh uh like it's like uh, in john wick the hotel right yeah I'd say the hotel, or if you've seen um, Luke Cage, um, Pop's Barbershop. Well, that lasted only until Luke, uh, until the barbershop got blew, not blown up, right? Like, it's, yeah. it did not, it was neutral territory that did not last very long. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's, I just, it's just a case of adding, adding potential for, for future drama, and... With some with something like that, having a having a mystery of who of who killed off the owner of the shop, um, you've got you've got se you've got several culprits, and obviously some of them are re some of them are red herrings. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people have different ways of having fun. I enjoy a good murder mystery game. Uh, I know for some people it can feel like more like it's challenging the player than it is challenging the character, and that can get uh, concerning for some. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I, I do really like a good murder mystery. Uh, probably my mother's influence, but 
and that that's just that's just one, that's just one example of that kind of thing. Oh. Um, but it's it's something I could easily see transferring over into into fight to survive the way you've described it. Now, absolutely, yeah. With, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? I know that these kind of things can change with stretch goals and the like. Well, it's going to be 200 pages. Mildred, I'm a publisher by day. Like, I, I'm a trade magazine publisher, so I've published, you know, hundreds of magazines. So I'm very good at the editorial side of things. Uh, I'm also doing the page layout. Uh, so I know that if I say it's going to be 200 pages, it's probably only going to be between 180 and 220 pages. So it's, uh, uh, it's pretty accurate. That's what it's going to be. Um, and if not, I'll pad it out until it is 200, uh, 200 pages with extra material. Um, so that's, that's yeah, 200 pages, digest, five and a half by eight and a half, uh, full color. Mm -hmm. So it's you who I have to yell at if, there, if the PDF comes out and there's no bookmarks. Yes. I mean, it's me that you have to yell at anyway for anything. Like, I've got an amazing artist named Ian McLean who has done art for Pathfinder and for Call of Cthulhu, and he's doing the art for this, and it's a knockout, no pun intended. Uh, he's doing the art, and then I've got a an editor who's going to be editing my work, uh, and I've got a sensitivity reader. But otherwise, I'm doing the rest of it. I did the design, uh, the development, the writing, and I'm laying out the book as well. And I guess I'm leading the Kickstarter. Yeah. I guess I'm the project leader as well. Yeah. yeah so, so, um, so I'm the one to blame in every case. No matter what happens, I'm the, first rule I'm the one leadership, to leadership, everything is your fault. Yeah, exactly. That's I'm predisposed to that. Now, what are you shooting for as far as the release window? Not a date, but a general ballpark area. August. It'll be done by August. I mean, the thing is, the editorial is already done. It's just... and the editing budget uh, and the advertising budget to pay for the Kickstarter. So w we can get that out of the way. Then we can I can start applying those pages in a large scale. Uh, you know, the PDF should be ready around June-ish. Uh, and the, the book, like pa padding in some dates just in case there's any kind of conflict when I get the uh, print proofs back, uh, it should be going out and fine by August. And if I manage to surprise people and get everything in earlier, then hooray. And I'll certainly be looking forward to it, especially since, well, if it if it's coming out in August, that'll be just in time for my birthday. Well, there we go. That's 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 our new goal. It's Mildred's birthday. We're gonna make sure Mildred has a happy, happy birthday. Yeah, I, uh, I'll as look look as long as I'm not here and singing or I'm not or I'm not dealing with chocolate cake, um, it's a wit it's a win in my book. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. I'll have your chocolate cake, and then everybody will be happy. Yeah. Uh, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Well, absolutely. You know, it's a pleasure to talk to somebody who understands my video game references. Uh, I'm, I'm a rare breed sometimes. But anytime you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to whether it's to share. Um, whether it's to share trauma stories of getting abused by geese's grapple counters, or 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 just to just to laugh at whoever at whoever thought maining Dan is a good idea, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, thank you very much, Mildra, and thank you for having me on. And if anybody out there is interested in picking up Fight to Survive, the Kickstarter is going until April 12th is the closing date. It's 82% funded now, which means, you know, we're fine, but like, uh, by all means, buy, 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 and contribute and pledge. Uh, you can still get some pretty great rewards, and there's some pretty great add-ons in terms of adding yourself into the game in different ways, if that's what you're interested in doing. Uh, because I love the community co to contribute, uh, to the game, and uh, I think it's very exciting, and we're going to get a uh, great game going with Fight to Survive. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>